fala, fala hoje, né? Eh, vocês conhecem já ao, ao Jonathan, os que não conhecem, bom, eh, vou apresentar. Ele, ele, eh, ele da, da, do, do Instituto da Universidade de North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Ele é presidente do International Federation of Data Organization e também é membro do, do, do comitê inaugural do Global Dataverse Community Consortium e do Core Trustee Seal, da Assembly of Reviewers. Ele, ele, hoje nós vamos falar um pouco sobre essa parte da relação dos princípios, ou dos, das diretrizes, ou dos dados first, né, com a preservação digital. É, bom, em especial, bom, vocês, vocês já, alguns de vocês já trabalharam no início, já fizeram pesquisa sobre isso. É, eu acredito que o que ele vai nos dizer vai nos nivelar também para podermos discutir com ele e, e fazer perguntas que realmente nos interessam nesse momento, né? Então, eh, as instruções são bem simples. Vamos deixar ele falar por, por 40 minutos, mais ou menos, e vamos escrevendo nossas perguntas, tá? Os que quiserem já colocar suas perguntas no, no, no bate-papo, no chat, eh, podem colocar as perguntas aí, ou se não, ao, ao final da fala dele, abriremos os microfones para vocês, né? para quem tiver a pergunta a fazer, ok? Então, vamos fazer isso um pouco, um pouco ágil, porque quando vocês sabem, sabem, quando é muita gente, podemos demorar muito fazendo a pergunta e não damos mais tempo para as outras pessoas. Então, tudo vai ser assim. A partir dos 40 minutos, eh, vão a começar as perguntas e a conversa com ele sobre esses aspectos ou esses assuntos que interessam a você da, da parte das recomendações, né? E, 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 não sei, alguns critérios que talvez vocês possam dizer que tem que ser mais esclarecidos para nós, para a nossa realidade. É muito interessante toda essa parte. Nós eh, temos eh, vários convidados, várias eh, pessoas que estão aqui, também outras pessoas que não puderam vir, que estavam eh, tentando fazer essa essa relação entre o que realmente os dados fers, o que, que se ganha com os dados fers na parte da preservação digital. Né? Ou seja, se esses dados eh, gerados eles, de diferentes comunidades científicas, né? eles vão a ter essa, essa possibilidade de preservação em seus formatos originais, mesmo usando software proprietário, não? Essas coisas assim, teríamos que ter uma claridade agora, né? Para entender bem se esse ciclo de vida dos dados, se essas ações, a gente vai poder eh, dizer que estamos cumprindo, né? <risos> ok? Então, vou dar início, então, para essa parte eh, na qual o Jonathan vai falar. Ok, Jonathan, você tem 40 minutos sim, sim. para falar em nome da, do grupo da, da Rede Carinhada da, e da, do grupo de pesquisa. Eu agradeço é pela legal, disponibilidade e também já, já quero colocar para vocês que nos próximos dois meses vamos ter mais Eu tenho que escutar conversas. Como você está vamos ter mais conversas, outra sobre curadoria de dados também e outra, outra sobre preservação de páginas web com pessoas do exterior. Vai ser bastante interessante, ok? Então, Jonathan, deixo com você, não se preocupa, só fala devagar o inglês e Sim. pode usar para expressões em português, as pessoas entendem, tá? No, no problema. Okay. No então, problema. eu peço para desligar os microfones, tá? E a gente com, com, continua. Pode, pode começar. Muito bom, muito bom. Uh... Pode compartilhar a tela. Todos viram a minha tela? Tela essa? Sim? Yes. Muito bom. Ai, ai, ai. Bem-vindos, bem-vindos, meus amigos. Estou feliz por estar aqui. Um, é, 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 é muito, muito feliz. Uh, primeiro, gostaria de dizer que me caro é com todos que lutam contra o Covid, especialmente todos os meus grandes amigos no Brasil. Sinto falta do Brasil, mais do que você imagina. Sim, esse é um momento difícil para todos. Meu português não é bom, mas estou aprendendo. Espero uh, que meu inglês seja melhor. English from here on, because my Portuguese is not very good. <laughs> So, I want to I want to start I want to start with a, a outline of, of what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, as Miguel mentioned, we are going to talk about fair, 
But really what I want to talk about is how FAIR relates to research data and scientific data. Uh, and we'll, we'll touch across FAIR real quickly because I am in a room full of experts with FAIR. Hi. Everyone here knows about FAIR. So, uh, but then I want to talk about the challenges with FAIR that are particular to research data and scientific research data and why just being FAIR sometimes is not enough. Uh, and we need to trust the data. Not only that the data is fair, but it has to be trusted to be fair and how those things are complementary. And then we'll talk about a little question uh, uh, from there. And, and we'll probably uh, have plenty of time at the end for questions. Uh, so just let me know. Okay, so fair principles. Uh, this is a slide that came from a recent presentation uh, for a project that's funded by the European Union called FAIR's FAIR. Uh, and it's similar to the Go Fair initiative in that it's not just about the principles, but it's about trying to use the principles to put them in action. So what the community is realizing is there's a lot to unpack, especially around research data, when we try to make them fair. We all know they need persistent identifiers and rich metadata. Uh, and we need those uh, PIDs within that metadata. We understand we want it accessible. That's pretty simple. We need to make it as free as possible and authentication if you have to. We understand that they need to be interoperable, but that is a very difficult thing with many uh, disciplines that are sharing data uh, with multiple disciplines, interdisciplinary work, because the vocabularies are not the same. Everyone doesn't use the same vocabularies and are the vocabularies themselves fair? And if you're gonna have all these different vocabularies with all these different metadata, you really need linked metadata. You need to be able to move from one set of metadata to the other. Uh, and the big one here is reusable. Uh, and the last block here is community standards. And as we all know, some communities have great standards, some have no standards, uh, and they can be very, uh, they can vary widely between different research uh, uh, groups. So these are the types of things we want to talk about relative to research data. So what are the challenges when we try to make our research data fair? There are a number of them. I want to I want to be sure that I get this point. Managing the digital object preserving that digital object is required. And that is a critical component, absolutely critical that you manage that digital object appropriately and put the appropriate metadata with it. I don't want to, uh, to sound like uh, we're forgetting that part and when I dig into all the different components of research data, but there are lots of resources about managing digital preservation at the object level, just taking an object putting it in a, in a preservation store and keeping it over time and what you have to do to that. I, I'm, I'm uh, preaching to the crowd as they say here, uh, here but uh, I'm talking to people who really already know this. Um, so uh, th there's lots of details both in Brazil and in America, uh, at the US here. Uh, Educopia just released a really interesting uh, document that talks about born digital archival workflows and how you document the process all along. Uh, the U.S. National Archive, uh, similar to the, uh, the uh, archive in, in uh, Rio, has produced a digital preservation framework. Uh, they just updated it actually this week. Uh, it has like 16 different file formats of how to deal with these objects. And there, it's really important to follow those uh, structures. And it takes special skills to do that. No question. These are really important skills that um, many of us have been learning over the last six or eight or ten years. Things like the data curation profiles, uh, if you're familiar with those, it allows uh, an archivist or a curator to go in and talk with the researcher, talk with the scientist, and understand what the profile of that data is, the home of that data, where the data came from, all the way through the process, and it allows you to be able to preserve that data better. These are all great tools. There's also data management tools, tons of data management planning tools. Um, this one here is based out of California. Uh, there's a group within the Research Data Alliance. 
and this group is a part of that group that are trying to make these data management plans, not just a textual document, but a machine readable thing where you can actually have archives call these up and, and read the requirements for the data and maybe put some policies around the data based upon these, these tools. So there are lots of really interesting things out there going on about preserving uh, research data and preserving those data. But one thing I think that we, we have to realize, and it gets more complicated with research data, is that the context is the most critical component because the research process can have many, many actors. And often the actors change and leave almost it's inevitable with every big research project here that we've dealt with at UNC is that you'll have students, you'll have faculty members, and they move, they leave, they change, sometimes in the middle of the project, sometimes just after the project. So getting back in touch with these people is hard down the road. You have to plan for that in advance and you have to gather enough documentation so you don't have to contact all these different actors. In addition to actors, um, where you may have a, a PDF or, or, or a textual document to preserve, um, it's not as critical what produced that instrument. A PDF is a PDF or a textual document is a textual document. There are some underlying metadata that are real important, but not as critical as the research processes that some scientific, some scientific uh, instruments are. For example, they may mix uh, what we call wet labs uh, as well as the, the, the dry lab. So you may have an instrument that has fluids where you have to actually put soak the, uh, the, the actual product and then use either lasers or, uh, or microscopes, electron microscopes to view that. So there's a combination of instruments that are wet and dry and you have to be able to record the metadata. It makes a huge difference that context is very critical. For example, in something like flow cytometry where they uh, suspend cells in a fluid uh, we worked on projects where that fluid itself has many properties. And if you change the fluid in the machine, you change the results of the data. Uh, the, the laser may use the same method, but if the fluid was changed, so if the person changed the fluid and didn't note it, and didn't note the type of fluid, the pH of the fluid, all those types of things, it's really critical. And when you get all the way to the end where you're writing an article, doing your research, you really need to know all of these components. So there's lots of pieces. And instruments to some research groups are not even instruments to others. For example, in our survey methodology group, they call their surveys an instrument, their survey instruments. So when someone says instrument, it could not mean a piece of hardware, a microscope or a laser. It could mean a survey instrument. So there's lots of things, the context around. In addition, there's lots of methodologies. Just in the quantitative alone, there's tons of methodologies. And that context around how the methodology was conducted is really critical. So you need to gather all that information on uh, things like weighting or, or anything around the data gathering is, and a data analysis is really important. It's also very temporal. Research data is, is always changing and the environment that you're doing the research changes. Um, it, it ranges, uh, even in the social world, it makes a big difference, but for sure in the environmental world, everything matters. So you have to collect all these small components. So it's not just this piece of data. It's not this file that comes out of a piece of software. It's all the things that go around it. So there's a, an environment wrapped around all of these things. And most all of them have controls, experimental controls. Some are lab controls. Some are uh, the way you choose your, uh, uh, your population and you choose your sample out of your population if you're doing a survey. There's tons of controls around these experiments that we have to think about and record in the metadata in order for these data to be fair. And it's, it's difficult because there's lots of components here. The, format, the formats are very crazy. You may have some disciplines that are really good about using one or two formats, 
and other disciplines that use non-standard formats and uh, methodologies that are not very well documented. The most critical component, especially when we're talking about trying to make data reusable tens of years into the future or dozens of years into the future, is that we got to understand that there are also different types of environmental effects Unfortunately, uh, both in the US and Brazil, we both know this, that there are a lot of political and social pressures around data, suppressing data, giving the best spin on the data you can, you know, not talking about both the numerator and the denominator, but just talk about one piece of the formula. Uh, it, it's, it's critical that we understand that how these data were presented and calculated and the methods, there's an environment around those. Uh, and we see those all the time. Uh, one thing that um, I, I'm sure you're, you're experts on this, but if you look at the COVID data uh, for many countries, including Brazil, that reporting is poor on the weekends and holidays. So it may look like things are getting better if you look at like a two or a three day average, but if you look at a seven day average, you start seeing it smooth out some. So things like that, uh, there, there's always pressures to uh, how you view these data. So we have to be very careful about including that context and the things around the data, because 20 years from now, when another epidemic or pandemic happens, we wanna compare them and we have to compare based upon the same types of uh, environment, political and social are included. In addition, scientific research is very complicated. There's lots of, lots of methodologies, lots of software, uh, lots of different softwares for data cleaning, different softwares for data analysis. Often it's specialized, it's proprietary, it can be expensive. Uh, it, it's very hard to reproduce something if you don't have the software. Uh, what we found is, is in an often case, it's not only specialized software, but it's custom software. The research team has written code to do the analysis. Um, if they were professional programmers and they worked in a, a, a large professional shop that was required a really detailed uh, uh, documentation of their code, exactly what the code doing, that's, that's okay. That might work good. But often these are graduate assistants or they're researchers uh, and scientists who just want to write enough code to do the analysis. They don't think about explaining the code because they understand it. Uh, they don't, they haven't had that, that programming class where you fail if you don't put the documentation in there, even if your code works successfully. So they don't understand that. It's not their type of uh, a world they live in. So this custom code is really difficult when you try to use it many years later. And often the analysis itself is, is novel, it's new, it's a new analysis, and it's cutting edge research, it's gonna be new, and not many people understand it. So we need to be able to explain that, and sometimes that's very difficult. To make it even worse, often we're using human subjects. Health information, privacy issues, um, there are crazy privacy issues all over the world now, uh, that vary by country and culture. Uh, with, the, with the mobility studies, I'm working on a mobility study here in the US to, to, to look at uh, isolation uh, of, of uh, people that potentially may have COVID. Uh, and we're gathering cell phone data off the cell phone towers and de-identifying that data. Uh, many countries are collecting that data and the rules vary by country. So if you're gonna share data across, uh, across our borders, then we need to think about the sensitivity of the data depending on that country or that culture. We're in a, a global pandemic, so we all ought to realize we, we're going to have to work together. We have to work together to solve these problems. Uh, the only way we solve global problems is sharing data globally and working together. Uh, and uh, I, I know uh, all our friends in Brazil do that all the time, but we need to think about how we describe the data and keep the, the sensitivity of the data within that metadata so we know what we can and can't share. There are even some um, examples in some qualitative data 
I worked with a team in Australia that was, uh, that was uh, archiving some Aboriginal culture data. And while it seems a little odd to modern cultures, in their culture, it wasn't permitted for uh, um, people of the female gender to see some of that data. It was, it was part of their culture and they would not allow us to archive it if we allowed someone who was a female to look at some of this data that was only seen by males in their culture. And while that's shocking for most of us and would never hold, but in that culture, they felt that that was important and it's better to archive that data under their rules than lose that data because in the future we'll need to, to analyze that. Of course, the sensitivity also varies by uh, research methodology because if you have a qualitative study, for example, uh, it, it's that context that matters. The researcher is embedded with that community and has that, that feel of that community. So the research data itself may be sensitive just because they're so embedded in that community. So we have to think about that. If you're going to preserve qualitative data uh, that has these types of sensitivities, we all need to be thinking about that as we try to archive and preserve them because we want to preserve them for future use, but that context is important for two reasons. One, it may hold the sensitive, uh, the sensitive type of data that's uh, not allowed, but in addition, if you don't have the context, you might not be able to use or reuse uh, in, in that R and, and FAIR, reuse it appropriately. And sometimes that scares off researchers. They don't want to share their data and they don't want to make it reusable because they're afraid someone will use it inappropriately. So we need to think through that as we work through this process. So FAIR is hard, and let's think about why, it, it, why it's not enough as well. If you think about the, the AIR, the AIR, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, even if you preserve those objects with all of those standards that we talked about earlier and all the great skill sets, it's possible that due to the things we just mentioned, things like sensitivity or uh, context or lack of context or lack of software or lack of understanding of that complex code, that uh, this air may be dirty, right? Uh, and as, uh, as people are struggling in hospitals all around the world for air if they have COVID, you know, if, if we don't provide good air, research just won't be trustworthy. And it, it may turn out that even though you think the data is fair, we don't trust that data because the, the metadata and the things that we've created with FAIR are just not trustworthy. So why would they not be trustworthy? Well, this is the big challenge of the way I see it in my perspective. If you're preserving a file format that is fairly, uh, I'm not gonna say flat, but something like a text file or a, a document, you don't have to have quite as many special as specialized skills. Archivists and curators need these special skills when they start dealing with uh, uh, complicated data sets that have uh, complex code in them. To understand them, they, need, they may need access to statisticians and researchers. We do some work here for reproducibility for several journals and, and our curators and archivists all the time have to be working with our statisticians and our researchers to understand the new methodologies so they can put enough context around that data so that data can be reused. Those skills vary across disciplinary con content. The same curator that would be great at social science data is gonna be challenged if, if they're looking at epidemiology. Well, I mean, epidemiology kind of overlaps. So let's pick a different one. What about uh, physics, uh, uh, physics data? or uh, a nuclear physicist type data, or maybe um, data, data from, a, uh, uh, from a lab, a wet lab somewhere, a flow cytometry data, or uh, electron microscope data. Those, those same curators and archivists don't even have the tools on their desktop. They can't open that data. Uh, recently, for example, we got a, a, a disk that we wanted to archive that came from our uh, state government and it had dumps of uh, databases, backups of databases. We didn't even know what was in the database. We had, to, we had to load software just to get the database to open 
and then to see what was in it. We were fortunate enough here at Odom to have these software skills and we had programmers and had database people who could do that. But imagine if that was some specialized piece of software from a telescope uh, or from something uh, from one of these uh, NASA labs and we don't have that to be able to look at. So it's those specialized skills that vary across disciplinary content, across methodologies, different for qualitative and quantitative. If you're doing a spatial analysis, you have to have a different set of skills. The data formats themselves that come out of all of these different research methodologies and disciplines are all different. Those data formats, some may not be preservable. You may not be able to preserve those. So you need to know that they're not preservable in long term in the future that you have to come up with some sort of surrogate or some way to describe them uh, and be able to preserve them. Uh, for example, in, uh, in our Dataverse uh, here at Odom, if we get quantitative files in uh, SPSS or Stata, uh, we are aware that potentially IBM may sell SPSS or get rid of SPSS. So we create tabular files uh, for those data and create metadata around that tabular file so we know it's good in the future. The challenge here is it changes all the time. This is not something that you can just think about and then forget tomorrow. You can fix it when you deposit it. You have to go back into your archive and look, can I still open these files five years, 10 years later? So it, it's that ongoing work that requires those special skills. And as you start having a more broad repository, the skills expand. And this is the big challenge. Uh, it, it is good to use economy of, of scale because digital objects can all go into the same repository. The problem is if you put all the different types and you have one type of archivist and one set of curators there, they may not have the skills for all the different methodologies, all the different disciplinary content, and some data will get a better treatment than others. And in order to trust that archive, we need to have the skill sets that manage all of these types of methodologies and file formats and disciplinary content. So we need to trust that these things can be reusable. That pres preservation package needs to contain all that information to ensure trust. Um, that repository or archive must do that. That's, that's part of the repository. That's not the data itself, that's the repository it has to be sure you include enough stuff to make that data um, uh, interchangeable and make that data reusable. There are cases where it's not possible. We need to at very least give the users enough information so they can make the determination if that data is reusable for their project, if it's interchangeable with their data. We need to provide enough metadata that the researcher who knows their research and knows what they need can make that determination. There are situations where some researchers use marginal data, data that you and I might think are marginal, but they use it to produce good results because mm -hmm. they have methods that allow them to do that. There may be, that may be the only data they have. And the research, as long as it's defined appropriately, and the metadata is there and you disclose and as transparency, and we'll talk about transparency in a little bit, as long as it's transparent, what data they used and the limitations on that data, the research still can be good, even though the data could be marginal, it may be all they can get. So in order to trust, the highest level of trust is reproducibility. Can you take the data and code and reproduce that process? Uh, we all want to be able to take data and reproduce it in order to trust it. But the original researcher and curator could not be available. So will they have enough information? If you want to redo this a year from now, will you be able to? And in the past, we took it on faith for many years that researchers were honest, they did everything appropriately, and they didn't make mistakes. They thought the peer review process was going to look at all of that. But the peer review process didn't see the data often in, in times uh, years ago. But now what we're starting to see is people wanting to see the data. What's going on here? And this is a, a classic example of uh, several years ago where show me the data. They want to see the data. So when the data was looked at 
and uh, several people got to looking deeper into this data for this experiment on the transmission of support of uh, gay equality. It turned out they had to retract the article. It turned out they were dishonest. They didn't do the right thing. It's very sad and it creates the distrust in the, the scientific enterprise. But what is really interesting about this one is that the idea that the hypothesis was good, right? They wanted, so someone wanted to test it. So they went and took good data and had that data very transparent, redid this study using good data with good methodology and it was um, reproduced by a third party. And it turned out that the data were solid, the, ana the analysis con was convincing, everything worked, the data, this was published. So the original hypothesis was true, but for several years, it was thought to be not true because of the dishonesty of the original researcher. So I, my point is more and more groups are looking for data but they want to be able to reproduce it. And for sim more simple things, this was a survey, but uh, imagine a world where you're trying to reproduce one of these very complex scientific workflows. We need to be sure we have all the information so you can attempt to do that. So how do we trust the scientific process if we can't trust our archives? And we gotta be sure that archives have enough information and it can sustain that information into the future. This is a, a sad but true statistic. It was an article written about five years ago um, that they looked at an 18 year period of the National Institute of Health here in the US and they looked at 328 biomedical databases. 62% were dead and gone, data lost. 15% weren't uh, findable because they were archived, they, you couldn't retrieve them. So basically 77% of all of that data were not fair. It's not possible to be fair because you can't get them, right? The first thing you think, well, maybe we didn't spend enough money, right? Everyone thinks money solves problems. The NIH during that similar period spent over a trillion US dollars, huge amounts of money. So 77% of that was lost, gone. So clearly it's not about money, uh, and, and clearly we have a problem. We need to be sure that we can trust our archives. And to do that, we need to think about what it means to be trusted. So when I think, when I think about this, I think of it as uh, FAIR defines the properties of the data and metadata. You're looking at an object and all the stuff is in the object, all the metadata, all the things that are in that object uh, are defined by those FAIR principles we just talked about but the repositories themselves have to work together with these objects. Because if you cannot find them a year from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, they're definitely not findable for a long period. They may only be findable for a day or two, right? Or a project or during the project. So trust describes the characteristics of the data repositories that are responsible to manage these fair data over a period of time or whatever that period of time, you could define that as 10 years or 20 years or forever. It's up to your repository uh, to be transparent about what that really means. So we need to have fair data, but it needs to be in repositories that we trust. So the trust principles, T-R-U-S-T, define what us as uh, archivists and curators need within our uh, repositories to be trusted. So we break this down into just like FAIR. FAIR seemed to work for FAIR, so we thought we'd do it with trust. So the T is for transparency. Uh, we need to know about the research process, how it happened, the workflows of the research process, all the information that is needed to make the data fair needs to be transparent. We also need to be transparent about our organization. Are we, are we responsible? That's where the R comes in. How long are we responsible? We need to be transparent about, yes, we're gonna be responsible for this data for 10 years or 20 years. We're responsible for this user community. Every archive, um, the, the terminology in the OAIS model is designated community. 
right? So we all have a user focus. We want to be able to preserve the data for use by a designated community or that user focused group. And each user focused group requires different types of documentation, different types of file formats. So we need to think through that. And since we're talking about time, we're talking about sustainable overtime. We have to be transparent, responsible, and user focused through a long period of time. So how do we do that? Sometimes that is as simple as a budget. It's also as simple as have we trained our archivist well? If we're going to accept data from a flow cytometer, does my archivist know what the file formats that community needs to use? And do they have the tools and the software on their desktop or on their server to be able to open those up to be sure they're valid before they're archived, right? If you rely on the scientists to upload them, they're moving on to the next project. They're not as well situated to do this kind of work as archivists, libraries, and curators are because that's our job. We should do that. Now, we all need technology for this. I've mentioned technology all along the way. I have a technical background. I came from technology. So many people ask, well, why is not, why is it the T in technology the first one? Technology is super important. It is the bedrock that everything stands on, but it's not first. Transparency is first. You must be able to see what's going on. To trust something, it has to be transparent. You can have, there's lots of technologies, lots of different platforms that can be repositories. There's lots of technology you can use. And as long as everything's transparent, they all work. Some better than others, some more sustainable than others, uh, some more transparent than others. There's some technology that is proprietary. A lot of libraries love to go pay some corporate group to manage their archive. How transparent is that? How sustainable is that? What if that group raises the prices and you can't afford that? So all of these things stand on the technology. So in my opinion, uh, and, and I argued for technology to be last because it's, the, it's what everything is founded upon, but transparency is first. So trust is about providing a trusted repository for archiving and distributing the data. It can't be fair if you can't keep it there for a long time. You have to be transparent about the policies, the organizations, the people. People are super important. You can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't have good trained people who know what's going on in the designated community and understand the data coming in and understand the people who are taking the data out, it will not work. You must have trust in the people. Uh, there's lots of research around trust and trust is built between people. You also have to have reliable, secure operations with the technology. Clearly, the technology is important. You have to be able to sustain that infrastructure through time because we know that long-term preservation is a lot different than the short-term. And we need to be transparent uh, uh, in, and in the commitment we make to our community. If you're going to tell your community you're going to keep this data and you're going to keep the formats migrated and you're going to be sure it's uh, stored for five years or 10 years, they need to know. They need to know, will it be around? And that way they can help you seek funding if you need to make it longer. They need to know. So just to, to, to reiterate a little bit here, FAIR is about the data and metadata. Trust is about the repository. We need FAIR data and repositories for trust, transparency. You need to have public accessible evidence that the repository can and cannot offer. If you can't offer it, you need to say it. You need to be responsible uh, for the high quality data, the technical quality data services. You need to say you're responsible and take responsibility for that. You need to be user focused. Think about those users. Think about the community you're supporting. It needs to be sustainable that you can do this long term. If it's only sustainable for a handful of years, you need to say it's only sustainable for a handful of years. You need to be very transparent about all of these components and you need to have appropriate technology that's documented that so it's transparent what you're doing, where the data is. If you're gonna put the data in a cloud, that's great. We do it here at Odom. We put two copies in the cloud. We don't keep all our copies in the cloud. We keep them in a couple other places too, but it's very transparent. You can see where all our data is. 
and all our data isn't. You have to be transparent. All of these things, and the, the, today we're not focusing on how to uh, actually judge repositories and, and come up with uh, things like our core trust seal or one of the other types of evaluation schemes, but all of them rely on this type of trust. So trust is the principles and there are many ways you can evaluate trust. But what I want to talk about is today is just what trust is. So I guess the, the takeaway point here is that fair and trust are complementary, right? Uh, I have a colleague in Finland who said this, and, and I repeat it often because I think it's, uh, I think it's really, it's a really good quote. Uh, she says that research data will not become nor stay fair by magic. We need skilled people, transparent processes, interoperable technologies, and a collaboration to build, operate, and maintain research data infrastructures. That's a whole lot in that. And there's a lot of people, people in there, there's a lot of money in there, there's a lot of policy in there, but it, it really, uh, it, she talks about it in this article, but that, that quote really epitomizes what I'm talking about, about FAIR, and it gets even more complicated as the research data get more and more complex and we deal with more and more communities. So um, this trust principle was uh, written up in uh, an article that was recently published in Nature. Uh, the link is here. Um, the goal is to bring awareness to the community and have people sign on as, as a repository sign on to say they believe in these trust principles and they think that these trust principles are important. Uh, we've been very successful for so far. Lots of people think that this is a good idea. Uh, here's a couple, a couple adoptions that NIAID here in the U.S., the Institute of Health, has uh, signed on as a supporter, as well as the Research Data Alliance uh, has put forth a large group of people uh, to sign on to the efforts. And I encourage everyone to go read the article, see what you think. Uh, if you support it, uh, go to RDA or one of the places and, and add your logo, add your group, because I think that this is a community effort and we all need to get together to be sure that just making the data fair is great and we need to do it, but we also need to put it in, in trustworthy repositories. So fair data and repositories we trust and with research data, uh, given all the things we talked about today, there are many, many different areas you have to think about uh, when you do that. So I, I have, um, I, uh, I, I really, really appreciate it. I've talked way too much uh, and I probably need to do some listening now because I, I honestly believe that if you listen more and talk less, you learn. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear more. Okay, Jonathan, muito obrigado. Vamos, então, se você quiser fechar a tela, uh, the screen, então podemos ver a nossos, nossos participantes e podemos, então, conversar com eles, né? É, vou, nesse momento, então, a pedir para vocês, os que tiverem uma pergunta também, se não fizeram pelo chat ou não querem fazer pelo chat, podem também se manifestar é, pelo microfone, ok? Então, vamos ver, acho que temos uma pergunta já no chat. Sim, é, Jonathan está falando aqui a Marilis, e ela diz que How can archivists and librarians develop the skills to manage research data in a specific knowledge area? So, so the first thing I would suggest is look close to home. So find your researchers. Here at UNC, for example, we build relationships with different research groups. And a lot of times, they're very, very happy if you can embed one of your people or one of your students in their research project. So if they're in there working with them from the beginning, then your curator or your archivist uh, will learn those knowledges and skills while they work with them. We're fortunate here at UNC that some of our projects want us in those projects uh, so bad they actually pay us, that they will give us a little stipend or a piece of the grant to put one of our curators or archivists within the actual research project. So then through the whole process, we have a archivist inside the research and then they learn as, as they go. That's where I would start is low, close to home. 
But to, to be honest, uh, I think a lot of it is that we need to build relationships. It's all about building relationships. I already know you have a wonderful group of people here. You have a wonderful relationship within this network. I would, I would venture to guess that if you started sharing those skill sets across your universities and across your, then between all of you, you may have many of the skills needed if you could come up with a, a training, uh, maybe some sort of exchange training program. Uh, and we here, for example, at, at UNC would be happy to participate in it as well. And some of that can be virtual. Uh, what we're hoping to do with our Global Dataverse Community Consortium uh, that uh, uh, pushes and helps sponsor Dataverse, uh, starting in the fall, we're going to start having these tutorials where we might take a day and talk about curating uh, SAS data or curating uh, quantitative data. We might have another day on curating geospatial data, and we're going to bring experts in from around the world to do these little webinars. So we're hoping to start that this fall. And something like that, uh, if we can pool together, uh, and some of the people in, in Brazil could do one of the webinars based on some of the information uh, that you have there, it would be nice to do them in different languages. Uh, because in many, many cases, uh, there's a lot of crossover. For example, uh, Pedro uh, from uh, uh, Portugal uh, is, wanting, is building and putting together some training uh, based in uh, Portuguese. Now, I know it's, that it's not Brazilian Portuguese, it's a little different, but it would be much easier for folks in, in uh, Brazil to share training materials with folks in Portugal. And, and it's a no brainer that that would work. And uh, Pedro is ready to do that and interested in, we have to actually have a working group to start doing some of that. Uh, so I'd encourage building those networks uh, and, and connecting your network with other networks. Perfeito. A Marilis, alguma outra coisa, Marilis, queria se perguntar? Ok. Eh, Débora, você pode fazer a pergunta para ele? Hi, do you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. So, court trust seal. Yeah. So, so uh, th th there's two separate things. Trust, trust is a principle, right? You can have trust principles. The court, the court trust seal is public. You can go to the Core Trust Seal website. You can see all the approved, there's, I can't remember how many, there's 60 or 70 approved archives there. And it shows exactly all of their documentation on how they're trustworthy. You can take that information, you can go back to Embrapa or wherever else, and you can evaluate your archive based on what other people have done, based upon TRUST, based upon the 16 principles of Core Trust Seal, for example, if you choose that, you don't have to pay for the seal, right, to be trusted. Your community might appreciate having the seal to be trusted, but if you, if you can say that I follow all the trust principles, and if someone asks, well, how do you know? Well, you can say that I have looked at the OIS reference model. I went through the OIS reference model. I'm meeting an a international standard. I, we couldn't afford to do the core trust seal, but we use those principles to evaluate in a self-evaluation. There are other types of evaluations too. For example, um, uh, there was a Drambora, which was a, a risk-based uh, assessment you can use. I think it still may be online, Drambora's there. Uh, there are many other ways, and I think there's one, even uh, uh, a Latin American standard, uh, Miguel may help me, I'm blanking on the name, uh, North American something. But there's another one that doesn't cost anything. You just get you get the standard and you apply it. So, uh, you know, uh, just uh, be sure everyone knows I'm on the Core Trust Seal Board, right? So I evaluate Core Trust uh, repositories, and there is a fee to that. But in my personal opinion, it's not about whether you pay the fee and get the stamp of approval. Most people like that, and more many organizations want that. It's about trust. It's about trust in your repository. And that's why we did the trust principles, because you don't have to have all of this other to be trusted. If you're transparent uh, and you're responsible, you focus on your user community, uh, you, you make things sustainable, and you have good technology to build it on, and you make all that transparent, to me, you're trusted. 
Yeah. Thanks, Great. Jonathan. Just I want to make clear that we value the trust, the core trust, as you very much. It's just a, a matter of being hard to, to be funded, and you know very well the, yes. the situation in Brazil regarding science. So yes. it's not so easy to no. to have a, a sustainable uh, source of income to, to afford it. Yeah, we, we that we we aim to to get there. We and, and uh, your yeah. advice is very much uh, appreciated. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, Jonathan, um, maybe something else about the core to seal. Can you tell us a little bit how we can achieve the requirement number ten and the requirement number thirteen? Oh, yes. <laughs> So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna test me on those. I don't even know the numbers. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. No, no, it's because these are the ones who talk about preservation, long-term yeah. preservation. One says that the repository assumes responsibility for long-term preservation and manage this function uh, yeah. in a planning and documented way. Yeah. And yeah. the other one yeah. is the yeah. Well, this is the the, big, the first one. Yeah, yeah. So so How we can deal that. So so there there's a couple pieces there, right? And, and, and um, I feel that's, that's written a little bit vague on purpose because what, what you really want to say is not that I'm going to store this file forever. This digital object, I'm going to put it in here and I promise that I'm going to keep my hard drive good and it'll stay there forever. That's not enough because just because you have a hard drive that you can read 10 years from now, what if that hard drive contains a piece of software or, uh, or a uh, data that needs a piece of software that's not available 10 years from now. So you have to be able to migrate. You have to have that trained staff that you always look at it. For example, that's one reason Core Trust Seal is reevaluated every three years because you have to look at these things through time and that's the most important thing. Uh, I would much rather see someone when they write that requirement that we take responsibility for being sure the data is reusable through time and you have a policy stating that you can. If the one thing, the one thing I can say, uh, and I've done, I've done some research on what, what people in Cortra Seal agree is good, good evidence. The number one evidence is available. Hey, professora, <laughs> professora Lidia, <laughs> your microphone is activated. No, no, no. No? No. Oh, oh no. okay. Well, no. I don't have children in casa. Disculpa, disculpa. I'm culpable of the errado. But Jonathan, uh, it's so, very so, good what you're saying, but uh, I mean, if, when he's talking about digital preservation on the core seal, is yeah. that um, we need to show the one way that is very trust that we are doing that. I mean, right, how right. the uh, repository is going to show that he's doing it. So, so that, that's what I was going to say is the number one thing for this one and all the other requirements is that you have a published policy on mm -hmm. your website where people can get to that shows what you're promising. If you say, if you tell your community that I'm gonna preserve these statistical data sets for your community to make them available for 10 years, then what you're saying is that you're gonna migrate those to the appropriate formats over the next 10 years. So what you would need to have is number one, I would, in this case, you would have a policy that stated on your website that this is what you do. And in order to do that, uh, if you use migration, migration is great. That's what you would like to do. And then you can say, I'm, we migrated upon ingest. And then, for example, after three years or every five years, we re-examine to be sure that new file formats are not better and that we can still read the file formats and we make decisions to do a, another curation every so often. You can say that. For example, if you might want to use emulation, emulation is a, a way you can do these things too, right? So maybe you don't want to buy that. You want to emulate the software, the old software in the new forms. So 
the, the goal here is it, it's, uh, it's not to tell you how you need to preserve that for the long term. You just need to have a plan and the plan needs to be transparent. So you need to be trustworthy in that you put that plan on your internet, on your website where people can get to it, not only your users, but the user, your, your peer community and the user community can see that you are doing these actions to make them uh, usable into the future. And that, inc that can include, you know, being sure to put the, the hardware appropriate and, and migrating in multiple copies and all those kinds of things too. But I think the most difficult part is, is understanding the file formats because that takes those specialized skills. And as they change between groups, um, for example, uh, many groups are adding new data formats. It, for, uh, we have um, our highway department, for example. Uh, we have a traffic, uh, traffic and safety office that manages crashes where people crash their cars and they have uh, data about the crash and why it occurred. Well, what they're starting to do now is the police officer ha are using drones. They have a drone in the back of their car. They fly a drone up and survey the area. So now we have video from a drone in the same type of data set where we had these quantitative crash records. So now our curators are having to get new skills on how to manage those file formats. Very luckily that many people in the digital preservation world have been managing video files for a, a good while and there's a lot of standards there, but it, it just goes to show you that you have to change as you move through time, if that makes sense, Miguel. Okay, no, this makes sense. I, I'm just going to, to keep talking a little bit more. It's because uh, our friend from uh, the University of Barcelona is not able to be here today, but uh -huh. she asked me something to tell you. <laughs> uh, because I, um, now you are talking about format, and she's is want me to ask you how we can do the data fair uh, um, fair data if we're gonna deal with uh, data that is not open in and because are in the in the in the, in the uh, in commercial softwares sure. so uh, how can that do this this projects to be open so that that it, there's many reasons it cannot be open for example it's um uh, it could be sensitive data a uh, human data mm -hmm. uh, sensitive data uh things like uh, uh private uh, health data or personal data the and the commercial data as you mentioned so this is a this is a challenge but if you really look at what FAIR means. FAIR doesn't mean that you're going to give the data away for free to anyone anytime they ask. That's not what FAIR means. It means it's findable, accessible, which means you can get to it some way, that you're not putting any more uh, barriers in front of the data that are absolutely necessary to protect the user, to protect the data that where the data came from, and in this case, protect the company. Because if you don't, they're not gonna share anything at all. And you'd much rather have that data shared with the researchers that need it to do really critical work and put those restrictions in place than not share it at all. And that's what would happen. You would end up with silos. So uh, commercial data and sensitive data can be fair, but the metadata, needs to be shared as much metadata as possible so you know what it is and how to get it accessible means you know how to get it and you can get it it doesn't automatically mean you get it for free easy unfortunate in this in this world today everybody wants the data on the internet click the click the button and i got my data right they don't want to go through all of those processes but research for many years has had these very defined uh, institutional review boards or human subject processes and they, they work the same for this commercial data as well you have to have MOUs in place you have to have agreements in place and uh, it is a challenge because it, you have to have a lot of things that have to happen before you can just hand the data over uh, we have a project here we're working on for the National Science Foundation called impact uh, it's uh, there's a website at M, uh, cyberimpact.us that comes up with a way that you can share commercial or sensitive data uh, automatically through the web. But what it does is it allows people to, to have uh, encrypted signatures for all of these documents so you can prove who you are and that you've 
you've satisfied all the things in order to get to that data. So that data is totally fair. It's just a process as a workflow you must go through in order to actually access it. And it's not quite as a one click. So I think it can be fair, uh, but I do think there are extra challenges, if that makes sense, Miguel. No, that's can see. Well, now uh, I'm going to uh, to talk with uh, Marcus Vinicius. You are here. Yeah. Can you ask the question to Jonathan, please? Yes. Yes. Just a minute. Sorry. Are you listening? Yes. Sorry, I, I had I had a problem here. I asked about the uh, if it's possible to uh, with a uh, fair data data or trust repository without a creator. Uh, work with yes. self depositing Yep. So, so um, there, there's a couple answers here. Um, you have to have some defined level of of um, automated curation. For example, can you upload with just a title, an author, and a description? Right. So, in your archive, if your archive is transparent about it that all you provide is uh, digital objects as they come in. So if you define your archive that this data, I will, give you, I will only return it to you just like it was, you don't do any migrations, and the only metadata you say you have are a minimum set of metadata, uh, maybe, maybe Dublin Core or maybe just a handful of the DDI, but as long as that's transparent, and you told all your user community that this is what you do, and your user community agrees with you. That's, that's all they need, and that's all they want. The challenge, what the challenge here is what many uh, uh, institutional repositories or archive do is they let anybody upload anything for any discipline for any user community, and then it all in one place. So this user community might want more information than this user community, and you can, that's not fair for sure. But if you, if you be sure that you restrict your content around these certain areas and you're transparent, the number one thing is trans being transparent. You can be transparent as long as you uh, tell them exactly what you're doing. Now, that said, I think you have to have either some automated curation of some sort or at least uh, someone who takes responsibility to be sure that there are no major problems. And uh, we had a, uh, for example, um, Norway, the, the, the country of Norway created a network, uh, Dataverse NO, Dataverse Norway. And they have a central group, this many repository, and then uh, do, uh, maybe a dozen or so, or 10 or so different uh, um, libraries and universities depositing data in. They're, they wrote their core trust seal that they require the depositor to be the one to ensure that all the metadata was correct and everything. And that's their policy. So that central, uh, uh, the, the repository at the central university is not guaranteeing that they do it, but they're guaranteeing that they have a, an agreement with the depositor or the group of depositors that are being sure the data is curated. So for example, if your university wanted to, to offload that curation to the research group, not maybe not the individual researcher, that might be too complicated, but for example, if you've got a research group with a study, maybe you can have an agreement with them that, that, and give them directions on what needs to go in there. And then that data is curated, but it's curated it's self-curated it is the term that many people use, but they have to be self-curated around a set of uh, uh, defined measures. And you can build templates. For example, uh, in Dataverse, uh, the way we do it, we use uh, these metadata templates and they're required. You can, for example, have control vocabulary where they have to answer the question. They have to answer one of these three or four things. That forces the person uploading themselves to answer the question, so it's being curated because they had to answer that question uh, in the metadata, how the, your methodology, was it weighted, was it not weighted, for example. That's defining how these data are. So I, I think it's difficult, but it can be done, if that makes sense. Thanks okay. so much. Okay. 
É, alguém mais quer falar, por favor? O microfone está aberto. É, pode fazer a pergunta diretamente. Sim? Alguém? Então. Bom, aqui tem mais perguntas, mas eu queria deixar a espontaneidade. Então, alguém quer perguntar para ele? Bom, é, Gustavo, alguma pergunta técnica? <risos> Gustavo é da equipe da Caniniana, está mexendo com o Dataverse, uma nova versão. E aí? <risos> Bom, enquanto vocês pensam um pouquinho, é, está aqui... Bom, tem uma pergunta do Seca, que ele saiu, mas ele me pediu para perguntar para o Jonathan. É, Jonathan, é, sobre os direitos autorais, é, como, como lidar com os direitos autorais de, de dados de pesquisa quando são muitos autores? É, isso só é a responsabilidade da, do que submete ou de todos os participantes? Do you understand? No, I, I, about half the words I understood. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now it's about uh, 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 how, how to say it? rights. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rights. Uh, yeah. Who is the owner of the rights of the data? The yeah, one yeah. who is responsible for the deposit of all the team. So, so this is a very interesting uh, question, and and a lot of times it depends on local laws. Uh, and there's sometimes not agreement. Uh, so for example, a good example, in the US, many researchers think they own the data. That I collected it, it's mine. But if that, if that data was funded by a federal agency, the federal agency says, I own the data. It's public data. Federal paid for it, it's mine. But the researcher works for University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, they paid the paycheck, they believe they own it. So in, in many cases here in the US, you'll have this big argument that all three of them say they own it, right? That can happen. And in many countries, uh, I'm sure that's even more complex than that. So the key here is who owns the data depends upon the deposit agreement. So one of the things that a trustworthy repository has to have is a deposit agreement. When someone uh, deposits their data, they must give you the rights to it, right? Uh, they have to give you some kind of right. For example, uh, one of our things in our deposit agreement here at Odom, it says that they allow us to make multiple copies of it for preservation. If you don't, then it's, it could be illegal to make your two and three copies for preservation. So you need to add that into your deposit agreement. So one of the things when, if I'm a core trustee reviewer and I'm looking at your policies, the first thing I want to look for is rights. There's a whole section on rights. How do you manage those rights? Do you ask the user? Do they give you the right? So that's some of the things that the repository has to ask. It could be any number of those questions. So there is no good answer here because it could be any of them. The key is, have you got the policies in place and agreements in place that allow you the enough rights to preserve the data and distribute the data? Uh, and I saw a question that, that someone mentioned that sensitive data, for example, there's plenty of rights around sensitive. If someone asked that uh, sensitive data cannot be shared at all. Well, it is possible that there are some that is so sensitive that the, re that the data pr producer would never share it with anybody. But more than likely is that they would share it with someone in their group maybe, or someone who paid or someone who went through a certain security screening. So th there's more than likely, there's some sort of policies that would allow them to get in there and be able to reuse it. Maybe they can only reuse it for, um, for example, we have a, a one group that will let you use their data. It's sensitive data, but they will only let you use it if you tell them what you're gonna do with it. You can only use it for one year and you must sign all the original Institutional Review Board agreements so you don't violate the original uh, 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 human subjects. So it's very strict and it is sensitive and it contains all the really sensitive stuff, but if you will follow all those rules, then you can use it. And I'm certain you know, it's hard to make a blanket statement. All day, there's different levels of sensitivity, right? Some data are just absolutely never going to get shared because the government agency says no one gets to see these but us, right? I'm sure those do exist, but it's usually some sort of continuum from very open, 
to totally closed and most of it falls in the middle. Most of it's not totally, totally closed, if that makes sense. Okay. Amarilis, you say you're going to ask? Jonathan já acabou de responder sobre os dados sensíveis, se de fato nunca dá para abrir, mas existem as nuances aí, eu agradeço. Sim. Mas a última pergunta? Um, é, na verdade, talvez mais um comentário sobre Fala ele, é, por favor. Uhum. advocacy, or, um, raise awareness of the importance uhum. of um, research data management, because I work at the School of Architecture, and I've, sometimes at a hall I talk to a teacher, to another, to a student, and they don't even know what I'm talking about. So yes. it's like it's for hard science only. So yeah. how when any, any suggestion of how to to address the subject to them so with them? I, I think I the way I approach it, this is the way we approach it and the way I approach it. It's not you don't want to say these are the things you need to do. I like the idea that I'm here to help you. I want to educate you and show you how you can do your research better or more easily. So the first question I ask uh, uh, someone in the social science or the humanities, I ask them, if you had to redo your entire research, start from scratch, if you lost your hard drive, if you didn't have anything there, if I could give you your data back, could you reproduce your own research five years from now, 10 years from now? without that research assistant that did all the analysis for you, right? In many cases, it's the graduate students doing all the work, right? It's not the professor. The professor comes up with a hypothesis and it's the graduate student, right? Well, that graduate student may have left. They may have been brilliant. They left and now they work for Amazon or Google somewhere, right? They're not there anymore, right? Uh, so it doesn't matter whether it's in hard science or, or the humanities or social science. If you don't have the people that did the research, it's very hard. So you have to manage that data, which means uh, what they need to do is train their students how to manage that data so when the student leaves, they understand it. So I think it's, it, you kind of, I would turn it around and say, I'm here to help you uh, and ask that question, how would you um, handle this situation? Now, in the US, what's happening is, it's not only that, but the journals are starting to require it. Journals are requiring some high levels of data management and reproducibility. And if you want to get published, you must do it. So that's more of the stick rather than the carrot. But I think you have to start with the carrot. You have to say, here, let me help you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to train you. Uh, I have a student. Can I put a student in your research team to work with you uh, to show you what data management is? Um, uh, eventually it's going to be required, I think, required worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., you're already required to have a data management plan for every research proposal. You don't have a choice. It's required or you don't get any money. Uh, so I think you'll see that propagate because the, the, the European Union's doing it too. Australia's doing it. They're, it's starting to spread rapidly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Mais alguém quer fazer alguma pergunta? Sí. Catarina, eh, ¿alguien? No, <ríe> bueno, eh, bueno, ah, sí, Solange, ótimo, y una mano levantada. <ríe> yeah, I, I would like to make a question, but it's not related to preservation, or uh, is I am a, I'm part of a community of bibliometricians, yeah. so we are, we know that now with open science, uh, we are advocacy uh, open science here in Brazil. And so sharing data is becoming more and more common in right. some communities. And uh, in some specific project, it's required to share and to prepare your data since the beginning of your research, including uh, for asking funding, you have to present a plan how uh, will you deal with open data? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask you, Jonathan, if you, um, if you have you seen uh, some studies about uh, share, uh, using shared data, but 
related to bibliometrics and scientometrics studies, how people are dealing with this, or for instance, how uh, can I, um, how can I say, follow uh, data citation? That yeah. sometimes it is kind of different from uh, follow citation from papers. Yeah. How yeah. how how to deal with this? And if you have seen any studies about bibliometric indicators related to yeah. data sharing or open science? So that is a really critical component. Uh, and I, I would say several years ago, um, it might have been eight or ten years ago, uh, we, we came up within our data pass group, our social science research group, that we come up with a policy for citation of data that we publish that if you're going to use data, this is how you're cited. At that point, no one was citing data. They would cite the article, but they would never cite the data. So we did that and several other groups kind of followed suit. And more and more people started saying, hey, we need to cite data. So then several uh, commercial groups started collecting, Thomson Reuters and several other groups started coming up with these data metrics and they're starting to try to do that. So one of the groups that was doing it uh, through Thomson's Reuters came to us and asked if they could use OAI-PMH, a harvesting protocol, to grab all our data sets and start looking for citations. So there was people looking for this. The problem was that no one was citing it appropriately. It was in the footnotes or it, it wasn't really where it belonged, right? Acknowledgement and That's sometimes. right, Acknowledge. it really wasn't where it's belonged. So there's been a movement in the community to try to make that a little more formalized. There's a project right now that's headed up with a group, uh, uh, the data site group out of Germany. Uh, it's called Make Data Count. And make Data Count. Make Data Count. They're, they have a, a, a grant and they've been working with lots of different um, repositories in order to start tracking data citation. And they're working with the publishers and they're working with the repositories to try to track that. And what's, what's going to happen is within data site, it'll be a service. Not only do they give you the DOI, but they tell you who used your DOI. And that's going to be really nice because then, then you start tying the publications to the actual uh, DOI and you get a little bit better data. So it's just beginning. I think, uh, I think Dataverse actually just finished uh, some of the latest updates, software updates that's required to communicate back to the central server. But I think what you're going to see is over time, this problem gets a little easier, but it is a very hard problem right now. Very hard problem. Yeah, I think so, because sometimes I saw citation inside the, the, the body text or acknowledgement, or yeah. sometimes it appears in yeah. reference but it's not uh, uh, easy to identify that it is data. Yeah. But I, I mean, it's difficult to identify citation um, by machine, you know, because we are not following uh, some, some standards. And some researchers recommend that you should cite, you should cite your data set inside your paper and then, and also uh, in that availability yeah. session in yep. the body uh, text yep. and also in the reference. So it's, yeah. it's not clear for the community how to do it yet. Yeah, so the number one thing I would suggest, um, and there's a saying here, I'm not sure it translates well in, in Brazil, but there's a chicken and egg problem. Did the yes, chicken come is. first or the egg come it first, is. right? So. As repositories, I think it's on us to provide users a citation. If you okay. give them a citation and you tell them how to use it and it's, mm -hmm. and it's standardized and we come up with an agreement, then at least you can say, you didn't use my uh, citation format. If you'll use my citation format, then we'll solve the problem. So we can't complain that they didn't cite it until we provide them the citation they should use. So that's what we did many years ago. And uh, for example, one of the key things within our Dataverse is every single data set, every single file at the top of the page is, here's the citation. Download the citation and all the way, and download it in multiple formats. I think that's critical because we can't complain if they don't, if, if they don't cite it, if we don't tell them how to cite it. So we tell them how to cite it, then we can expect them to cite it later. That's my personal opinion.
Okay, thank you very much, John. Good to see you. Yeah. Yes, good to see you again. <laughs> Well, 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 I want to ask you something related to what Solange mentioned. Is the recommendation of the fair about implement of fair metrics? Mm -hmm. How we can do that? You know the recommendation number 29? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it, it's very difficult, right? The, the, these things are very difficult. So when, when people thought of fair, uh, it's easy to come up with uh, the, the acronym for fair. But when they started to do go fair or fair is fair, and they started, wait a minute, this is difficult, right? It's really a challenge. So there are no easy answers. There are no, no easy answers to this. I think you can do it, but the number one piece is transparent. Be transparent of what you can and can't do. And I don't see it as something, this is my personal opinion, things are not fair or not fair. They're not one or the other. The world is not that way. The world's not like a computer, zero or one, positive or negative. There's always a continuum. There are fairness to data. And you want to make it as fair as possible, right, given all the other restrictions, sensitive data or, or, uh, or the inability to, to uh, for example, I, I said earlier, and I should have qualified that, I said that you must make the metadata uh, accessible in public. Well, it's possible that some of the metadata is sensitive. For example, if, if for example, you're doing research on a, uh, uh, an endangered species, let's say you're doing a, a research on an endangered species, if, and that endangered species was worth money and people were selling it on the black market, the, the location of those animals is sensitive because if you release that, Someone's going to go kill them and, and they won't have them. So it's sensitive data. So you cannot, that's metadata about the data, but you can't release that metadata. So there are cases where the metadata themselves are sensitive and they can't be fair. So I guess my answer is there's a continuum. Of, we don't want everything totally closed and not fair. And we almost certainly can't make everything 100% fair but as a community, we should make a good faith effort to try to get as close to fair as we can. Okay, perfeito. Bom, eu vou deixar duas perguntas que o Gustavo da Cariniana quer fazer para você. Gustavo, quer falar? É, Gustavo, está por aí? Sim. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. É, é, é... Many researchers, they are ashamed if their papers are retracted. Yes, yes. So we don't have many, many places where we can look at the history. Yeah. A lot of, of papers that retracted. Yeah. I usually look at Retract and Watch, which I recommend as a great source. But uh, the question that I have is if retracted papers mm -hmm. are they worth to preserve to make the digital preservation or if they should be excluded from mm -hmm. preservation plans so my personal opinion here is they should be preserved um you, you really should preserve this this is this is a, a, a this is an insight in my personality so this is a personal opinion for sure I think that we must understand history. We must understand all that happened all through the time. Even things we don't like, we need to understand them because if you don't understand them, you're doomed to repeat them. I guess someone said that before. Someone probably famous has said that before. But uh, I think that uh, in, the, in the, the, with the retracted papers, I think that we need to be sure to document they were retracted, but we shouldn't remove them. They should be flagged. Uh, I, I like the idea of a retraction watch. I think that's good. I also think that data, there are data behind the retracted paper. So I'm not a publisher, so I'm not in that world. That was a, a personal opinion. But in data, I would always preserve the data. It's a different version. Uh, someone used it. If someone used it uh, to write a paper that was then retracted, someone may want to come back to see that data. So at a data repository, of course, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save all of that stuff. I'm going to version it. 
I'm going to put notations on it. I'm going to put links to the retraction. So I think that's really important because you need to follow that history of that object and follow history because if we don't, then you're preserving history. The whole idea here is preserving history and preserving the research. And, and that's a little bit of a personal opinion there. So I'm not sure if it's all professional. Okay. Eh, um, bom, eh, um, o Gustavo também tem uma pergunta técnica para fazer, né, Gustavo? Vamos ver se você mexe. I, I, we're gonna ask you something technical, ok? Gustavo, <laughs> please. <laughs> Ok, Gustavo? In Dataverse 5, you are going to, we are going to have to migrate from Glassfish to Payara. Payara, yeah. So, so maybe there will be issues with the migration. Uh, yeah. Uh, it would be better to start a new installation, migrate databases and um, virtual yeah. machine settings, or to, tie, or to tie, try to upgrade the, the, the old way. Yeah, so, so there's some discussion about this, uh, and there are a couple different opinions about the right way to go. Leonid, which is one of the Dataverse programmers at Harvard, he, he, he likes the idea of migrating step by step and moving forward. Uh, I disagree uh, and my staff disagrees uh, and I, I'm not sure I'm not sure I've told him I disagree but I, I personally if I'm going to run a production archive I like a clean install when you have something as major as something as infrastructure Pyara uh, and Glassfish change. I think the database needs to be migrated. I, I would prefer to have a clean uh, installation of Pyara that's working appropriately and that I can test it using industry standard testing to be sure it's right and then I can remove the database that's a proprietary database written uh, for, uh, for Dataverse, move that over into Pyara. Uh, I, I think that there might be and there usually is some pain when we make major changes uh, and anytime you go from a three to a four or four to a five, that's like raising the red flag. Be careful, here we come. Uh, but uh, I think that Pyara is going to be well worth it. We're excited. We're already trying it here at Odom. We've done it on some tests. It is much faster. It's easier to maintain. And the, uh, I, I like uh, how the, uh, the, uh, the ability to manage it will be a lot easier than managing uh, the glassfish. Glassfish for many years has been great, but it's a lot of overhead with Glassfish, and Glassfish is not uh, as easy as Pyar. So Pyar will be better. Uh, we don't have any migration documents yet. Uh, I think they will be coming uh, soon. There is some discussion on the Dataverse community list, and there's a um, we have a Git uh, GitHub channel where several of them are discussing what they're going to do with this migration and, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with those folks and get some of your input because it's not only what we think is right is everyone needs to give us their input uh, because they may have more you, you probably have more expertise with power than we do so we need to be sure we all communicate that so uh, I, I would say mine's think is clean brand new installation of power and then we'll migrate the database that's what we do here at Odom many times uh, to be honest, uh, I do that all the time. Even even currently, we will do the roll-ups uh, a lot of times on our test machine to see how they do. But if we have any question, we'll install a, a fresh. Uh, we use uh, a, a script to bring up a fresh fresh machine, and then we migrate the database. So I, I'm a migrate the database person. Okay, acho que você respondeu todas as perguntas. Eh, parece que Marcos queria saber, saber o programa. Qual é o nome do outro programa? Não, é, Payara. Não, I have a question about arquidemática. É, uh -huh. Because é, é, I work at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation and we chose é, é, arquidemática as preservation software. Yeah. And the, the last version of database, database, I think it's interoperable. I think that's the, the word, interoperable. Yeah, yeah. É, yeah. With uh, arquidemática. Uh, do you know any, any experience using both? 
no, we don't, we do not use that integration. And uh, I was not aware that, that the latest version broke that compatibility. I thought it was still working. Uh, my guess is there's probably an issue in GitHub to fix that. The challenge, the challenge is if you have these really tight integrations uh, and, and people write code that are not loosely integrated, but tightly integrated, that as Dataverse changes, someone has to manage that external code. And my guess is that external code didn't get managed. So what we need to do is, is work together. We're trying, uh, we're working, we actually hired the GDCC, hired Jim Meyer as a programmer. And, and uh, his job is to coordinate all the different community uh, developments. And in this case, it would be good to touch base with Jim and see what happened in Dataverse to break it. So it's his job to think about how we can build Dataverse where it won't break the, these external connections. So I can look into it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's something that we are really, um, um, uh, curious about the integration between Dataverse with Logs, with, um, yeah, yeah. with uh, Archivematica and other software for preservation. So, si ninguém tem mais perguntas, alguém, porque já passamos da hora e meia de, de conversa, eh, Jonathan não bebeu água até agora, então, vamos, então, poder, podemos dar por terminar a nossa reunião? Tudo bem? Ok, eu quero agradecer, se vocês têm alguma palavra para dizer para o Jonathan, não sei, está aberto aqui o microfone, ah, estão batendo palmas para você, já clapem. <risos> ok, bom, então muito obrigado novamente, Jonathan, pela disponibilidade, é, é, a apresentação e o vídeo vão ser disponibilizados para todos, tá? É, o vídeo, é, é, o Gil Denil tem uma proposta e aí a gente vai discutir sobre isso, é, depois eu, também Gil Denil tem uma estratégia para a tradução de, de palestras, né, Gil Denil? Não, quer, não queres contar, Gil Denil? <risos> Acho que ele não quer contar. Não, não eu estava mudo. Ah. Eu estava mudo, então... é que eu estava conseguindo. Não, é que eu coloquei, eu tenho um tradutor no celular, eu coloquei, ele foi pegando, ele fez a transliteração do, da fala do jo, Jonathan e ficou em português. Só que eu estava copiando e passando para o e-mail. Eu estava copiando e passando para o e-mail, quando de repente bati o dedo, perdi 30% do que eu estava fazendo. Um ódio disso. Oh, que pé. Mas a próxima vez vai ser, vai ser mais fácil. Mas eu consegui também nas perguntas fazer a transliteração. Okay. É, dá para fazer também de colocar naquele relatório. Perfeito. Então, bom, muito obrigado novamente. Estamos então disponíveis para o próximo encontro. Esse foi o nosso primeiro encontro. O próximo encontro vai ser com a nossa querida Sônia Barbosa, da Dataverse, em Harvard. Ela vai nos dar um, um webinar. Ela diz que pode até três dias, mas vamos ver como fazemos sobre curadoria de dados é, digitais. Ok? Então, muito obrigado e até a próxima. Obrigado, Jonathan. Tá? Então, Esperamos você no Brasil, quando abrirem as fronteiras. Sim, sim. Sim, Jonathan. Obrigada. Muito obrigado. 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 Obrigada, Miguel. Obrigada. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau. Okay. Vamos fechar? É. Ok. Ok. Jonathan, are you here? <laughs>